we are i clicked a few buttons let's see you guys might even get a notification which would be awesome the loading bar is halfway redirecting to facebook and <laughs> where are we hold on i do see uh i do see it says live on this end yeah, I see yeah, it. Yeah, live 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 live. Live. Oh, here we go. We are. <laughs> that was very weird. I hope. I hope this is. I'm looking. Oh yeah. Okay. I'm getting double feedback. We got it. <laughs> little delay. Right. Little delay. <laughs> um. All right. Let me uh just copy this link now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here live. This is a next level pop up. First time we're doing it, and we've got quite a story here for you. How we even decided to do this because. I'm not even sure what the story is, but I guess we'll just dive into it that way. Seth and Abel. So we have a, a group um, on LinkedIn that all four of us are in. It's a messaging thread. If you want to join this group, let us know. It's called Podcast Launchers. And it's, uh, I mean, really like Abel, Seth, um, Vinky, a lot of people in the group, we've all kind of launched a podcast within the three months. And so it's just sharing best tips and practices and helping everyone's show grow more than it even more than we wanted it to by being a part of this community um, within that first like three months. So anyway, Seth and Abel were saying something about uh, going live. I don't remember even what it was, but I was like, wait, have you guys, are you saying you haven't done it before or that you want to do it? I'm like, let's do it. So Seth or Abel, I don't remember wh where it started. Um, and Vinky also just kind of chimed in there at the end. And that's how we got here here with us. But no, Seth or yeah. Abel, if you guys could like just clarify how we ended up doing this. Yeah. <clears throat> so I have a, uh, hello everyone. My name is Abel Pacheco. Nice to meet you all. Uh, I have a, uh, a podcast and I think a couple of us, uh, all of us are kind of in this area, podcasting, sharing content. And every week I do a summary and my summary has all of the amazing guests that I've had on our show. And so I, I put out a post that says, these shows are going live, L-I-V-E, capitalized and and uh, what I what I meant was I really push these out like they're they're live now they're out. Uh, Seth asked me he goes hey how are you doing those live and I go you know what I'm not I'm not really pushing them live like the red live button I'm just distributing them out there. So uh, he asked me well how do, how in the world do I do that and I go I don't know if y'all figure it out I'm in because I'd love to to really get the amplification part of you know having the podcast recording and. Uh, one one live event going out and that's uh, enter Seth Seth's conversation and then you picked it up and and here we are live right so, so Seth what did I miss man yeah man I think you nailed it and I'm coming to you live right here from my father's truck in Waitstown West Virginia we don't have uh, we don't have cell phone service or wi-fi at my parents house in the country so I had to drive drive somewhere where I could get, get some uh, cell phone connection so that's why I'm sitting in a car right now um, but yeah, anyways, yeah, it, I thought you interpreted that as, or you meant live as in like red button, we are live. And I was asking you, how, how can we get that thing going? Um, and then we just started kind of brainstorming to see how we could actually broadcast our podcasts live. And, you know, there is that function on Zoom where we can do it on Facebook, like we're doing right now. Um, and then there's some other programs that we'd be able to blast it out to YouTube and uh twitch or wherever else we can do some live video on and then uh, of course adam knows everything about going live and kind of going off the cuff so he brought us together and said hey let's let's maybe do let's take that idea and do a pop-up so here we are i love it and I, it's funny as abel was going my, so something happened just now with my connection i hope you guys can hear me i timed out there but it seems like the story came through awesome cool um so yeah so here we are this is live i I hit up as soon as I knew we were going to do this. I hit up my VA, Rena. Shout out to Rena Guerrero. Um, I was like, Can you make me a background that says next level pop up? I need it for Monday. She's like, Yep, here you go. <laughs> so, um, Seth and Abel, thank you for accidentally starting this fire. Um, I'm excited about what we're going to talk about here today. And I think one of the cool things about um, what we're doing now here is going live is one, it's candid. Two, I kind of like the pop up concept because, like, I don't know. It just makes it feel like it just gives it a special essence that I can't really describe. But the cool thing is when we're done with this, um, we're going to be able to go back 
uh, take little bite-sized pieces. Don't worry, guys. I got you covered on this one, at least for today. I'm going to go back and chop this up in little bite-sized pieces of content. Shout out to Aaron Eiler. Aaron, thank you, thank you for all the work you do for us to do that. And then now we'll have like this cool little collection of content that we can share with our networks and hopefully add some value. And how could I, how could I continue on without shifting gears and, and giving a proper introduction to the mom of multifamily? This is like her silver screen debut, guys. Talk about um, just having the guts to just raise your hand and do it. We added Vinky to this podcast launchers group that we talked about maybe a week ago, two weeks tops. She's been very um, engaged and you could tell she just has a, a passion to want to grow her business. You can tell us a little bit about your business too, Vinky. I know we met at Yona Weiss's meetup and we started the, the catchphrase for you, the nickname, the mom of, mom of multifamily, but you've just been taking such massive action in all that you do and it's really cool to see how much you've already grown since I've known you over the past few months so I know that was a lot but just kind of want to give you a chance to take the mic and tell everyone a little bit about yourself and how you ended up here yeah of course thank you so much for this opportunity and first of all thank you for adding me to this group and also letting me come on to this uh live pop-up session with you guys uh, I come from an IT background I've been uh, in the IT for multiple years 20 some years and I'm also a professor at California State University. I teach the IT program, of course, with the IT background. And a few years back, I left my W-2 job and I was looking to do something else. So I uh, kind of stumbled upon multifamily. I got interested, I started looking into that and having the background in the commercial real estate before because I did some commercial brokerage uh, back with my W-2 job for four or five years. Had some single family, had some retail businesses as well, but I could not keep it up with my W-2 job. So I gave that up. I put it on the back burner that I will come back to it. And uh, that's what exactly happened, you know? And I was at a point now to retire. I thought, I'm not going to work when I left my W-2. I thought this is a good point now, I did enough. And one day, I'm not sure if you call it up epiphany or you call it my imagination. I woke up in the morning and I felt like there's a purpose for me that I wanted to go out, do something, make some money and make a difference in other people's life. You know, If I think I'm super smart, oh God, I'm an IT professor, I'm this and that, I should be doing something for the people who are un unfortunate, who do not have enough. And they are just living day to day there mundane life or they are in the survival mode, which they will never get out of it. So I can help them at least, you know, if I have something in me. So that's how I got started. I'm super happy. Excuse me. I started about, um, I would say seven, eight months ago. So I have um, about 100 units, a class, and also I'm closing this deal. That's end of this month on the 30th, under uh, about 144 units again, where's some LP and GP. So I will have 200, around 240 units by the end of the year. So I'm super happy about it where I am and then meeting cool people like you guys. I'm super excited uh, to network with you and then get, get to my goal where I wanted to go. I think that's a cool, uh, and, and thank you for the details there, Vinky. I like the, the goals you have set for uh, as far as doors, where you're at and the multifamily focus that goes right aligned with, as far as I know, Abel and Seth, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you guys are really, everyone here is focused in the same sector, that multifamily space. So I don't know, is there anything that Vinky just said that kind of gets you guys curious about what you're working on? No, I'm excited for you, uh, Vinky. Well, yes, I apologize. I'm excited <laughs> for you because I think that's, uh, you know, exactly what you mentioned resonates really well with a lot of people. And that's kind of how I fell into, you know, multifamily myself. So I'm excited for the journey and for it to begin. And, and uh, I have, I see a, a good long future ahead of you. And I, I, you know, I think what's really cool is like multifamily or commercial real estate investing in general, once you start putting your hat on to, you know, building wealth and creation, creating wealth and net worth, and, you know, trying to figure out a different way to, to earn, you know, it's, you realize it's, it's definitely not a short term game. It's a long term, long run marathon kind of, you know, effort. And so the every activity, every action, everything you take today will definitely uh, follow you for the years to come. And so I'm excited for, uh, for the long run. Yeah, absolutely. And I 100% uh, agree with you. I think it's just like consistency and also you got to be patient. So if you have the both, you know, I um, mean, I just 
feel like you feel super happy all the time and super charged, like I'm onto something big. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Uh, go ahead, Seth. <laughs> Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, Vinny, I think your, your story resonates with a lot of folks. I mean, a lot of people were kind of stuck in that W-2 job and they're looking for a way out, uh, at least looking to a way for a way to, you know, create passive income streams. And you've kind of you've already started to do that and you're going to ride that momentum wave to uh, lots of success. And I know we've had a lot of really good conversations. So 100 um, percent believe in what you're doing. And and uh, and yeah. I just remembered, I don't know if we addressed this yet, but Seth, you got to give us a little context because you're, you're Mr. San Diego surfs up, go to the gym. Like you're in an environment right now. That's not, that's not, well, maybe your, your roots, right. Where you came from, but you're not uh, in, in Cali right now. Where are you at? The, the surfing lawyer too, you know, lawyers don't <laughs> surf. I think a point break. <laughs> Old school I don't actually, I don't, do I have confirmation on that? Do you surf Seth? I can't remember. Yeah, I do. I try okay. to surf. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was going to be a lot easier for me because I, I feel like I'm pretty athletic and, you know, pretty good at stuff like that and picking stuff up pretty quickly. But man, surfing's uh, it's a different beast when you didn't grow up doing it because, you know, practice comes at a price. I mean, it's like, you know, when you do stand up, it's only for a few seconds compared to snowboarding or something like that, where you get some some opportunities to practice for a long period of time. It's uh, it's a different beast, man. <laughs> My brother, who's how old is Paul now? He's 26. He just started surfing for the first time this past summer. And he, he, I asked him, like, are you ever going to go surf in California? He's like, dude, no, I'm not. I'm not ready for that. He's in Charleston, South Carolina. And okay. uh, apparently, I don't know, the Pacific Coast is known to be even more intense, I guess, from a surfing perspective than the Atlantic. I don't know. That's just what I heard. Yeah, a lot more consistent out here on the West Coast and gets a little bit bigger, especially in the winter when the uh, tides start coming in, man. Right on. Well, uh, Seth, we have a, a webinar coming up later this month, so I can't help. We got to do a, just a quick little marketing plug here, guys. And Vinky and Abel, I hope you guys can tune into this presentation. Uh, Seth and Dan Lukowitz are going to be talking about uh, 2021 trends really going from uncertainty to opportunity in commercial real estate and um, excited to hear and learn from them throughout this process and Seth's focus as we kind of already addressed you know he's got the the legal background he's an attorney he's going to be talking about what to expect coming up this year as far as SEC regulations because there has been a lot of changes um, I'm going to kind of throw you a little bit in the fire here Seth but could you could you just share with us a little bit about what you kind of feel like the general climate for the industry is right now. Like what are, what are some things that, you know, I guess from a high level perspective, people are really paying a lot of attention to now than more than they have in the past. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of people know that the, you know, the definition of accredited investors changed a little bit. They've kind of opened that up to some, uh, some other avenues to, to be, to qualify as, as an accredited investor. Um, and then in the coming months, we'll see, but the SEC may be passing some new regulations, some amendments that'll, that'll kind of allow folks uh, to raise capital for these syndications a little bit easier. Um, they're kind of going to peel those layers back a little bit and, uh, you know, make it, make it a lot easier for people to, to be able to raise capital for these quote unquote smaller deals. And we're talking, you know, 10 million, tens of millions of dollars rather than, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars types of deals. So we'll just see where they go, but, you know, on the webinar, which is going to be incredible, we're going to kind of going to go over some of those things that, that they may be looking at. And if they do pass them and they do go through what that landscape might look like in 2021. That's awesome. I see hey. Abel, I see you jotting down those notes and Vinky, you're nodding your head. So let's hear it. what's, what's, what's I'm, popping. <laughs> I'm, I'm writing down a few things. Yeah. You know, you think about this year is exciting for, you know, any kind of commercial real estate, any real estate investor that's really thinking about how to, how to make some moves for all the reasons that Seth said from the SEC. And, you know, let me give you a few nuggets from my, you know, paradigm, which is a uh, commercial loan broker. So I do help uh, investors figure out where to where to get their debt from their debt financing for these 10 million 15 20 million dollar deals and so interest rates right now you know I, I don't know who knows if we have a crystal who knows where they're going to go if you have a crystal ball you let me know however uh, they we may have hit our you know quote unquote bottom is what some people are saying for interest rates uh, th a few vaccines for covid 
um, the stimulus being passed again, a hard floor on the 10 year treasury notes, which was at 60 basis points, I think in September ish has now crept up to like 90, 95 basis points. So instead of, you know, nearly half a point, now it's like a, you know, almost a full one, uh, 1% on the 10 year treasury. So there's positive pressure on the 10 year treasury that a couple of weeks ago, there was like a new record job increase from some of the unemployment. And then, um, you know, that they passed that the big stimulus next, you know, next uh, level stimulus, all that stuff just puts, puts pressure, positive pressure on the 10 year treasury, which, you know, rates typically follow, like it's not directly aligned, but there is some correlation as that rises. So do interest rates. So uh, if you're underwriting a deal, I'll give one thing. If you're underwriting a deal today, I would definitely assume a higher interest rate for a closing time, 60 to 90 days later. Uh, but all in all, you know, when you still think about it, man, these are record low interest rate times for us as investors. And if I'm borrowing from the bank at, you know, sub four percentage uh, rates and I'm trying to turn around a 14, 15% average annualized return or higher, man, there's a big spread. And that spread is where, you know, a lot of investors make a lot of money. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a great 2020. I'm excited. And uh, depending on what market class or asset class and market you're in, you know, it's all always going to depend on how much success you have. But those are all, you know, good, good. I like the outcomes in Texas and I like the outcomes in multifamily and some of the other markets as well. I agree with you, Abel, on the interest rate, I think, but it will uh, increase gradually. What are your thoughts on that? You know, it's not going to like shoot up right away. I mean, no, given the scenario. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Slow and steady. The vet, Fed said they weren't going to raise any, you know, do anything drastic and it'll be slow and steady. But that's why I like 2020. It's like, now's the time. Some people are, think are trying to, you know, I've heard also, well, I'm going to wait it out. I'm going to see how much lower I can get. I'll go, man, you're going to miss your window. 2020 is your year. Like go buy something big, do it now. Exactly. But I think it's going to might be the similar scenario for the next quarter or two. Then I'll gradually it might start moving up a little bit the trend, you know. But uh, 2021 might be a, still a good window for the people who are looking to invest for other, you know, couple quarters. I would say, or maybe yeah. the whole year. Who knows? Like you said, we do not have that. We do not have the crystal ball, but uh, you do not know. But I think still it's a good window for the people or the investors you're looking some, uh, you know, good investment opportunities. That'd be super nice. Agreed. The Great Recession in 2008 to 2010 ish, that two year window after 2008 was like one of those areas. If you look at the, you know, interest rates and what things were doing, it took a couple of years for interest rates to come back. I would have to say that COVID 19 is just my guess is probably a, a bigger impact than 2008. You know, it's, I, I guess just from the global perspective, right? So, you know, when you say that, okay, maybe you've got a two-year window to run, <laughs> you know, run, let's run hard. Yeah, but yeah our government, oh, Go ahead. sorry, I was just gonna say, yeah, our government's gonna be very delicate, I would think, with the, the interest rates and try to keep them as low as possible for at least, you know, the next year or so. But again, we don't have a crystal ball, but I, I think that they're gonna be really delicate with that situation, really uh, conservative with, you know, moving our economy forward and keeping it under control. Uh, with all the new things that's going on and all the uncertainty, so. That's true. And the other thing I wanted to add is um, in the interest rates, you know, it's not just the one factor, it's many factors. And we are kind of at a new portal now. We are in a scenario that we have never seen before. So we are at a new platform. So it's gonna, the how things gonna turn around is gonna be totally different. We cannot foresee that because we never have experienced this where we are today. So it's gonna be kind of a new experience. So we just have to wait and see how it's gonna unfold. Mm -hmm. And I, I think where we're all at, everyone in this room, the, the cool similarity that I'm seeing is, uh, you know, everyone's taking massive action. You know, we're the ones telling people that aren't taking action to take action as Abel just referenced. <laughs> and so um, historically speaking, you hear any stories of, of when a company or an individual made a, a huge leap forward in success or growth it's during times like this it's not when the market's even in steady i mean it can be but when the market's up and down and volatile is when the most exponential gains can be made and so 
it's good cool to hear what, what everyone's working on where everyone's heads at and then speaking of what everybody's working on now i want to start getting into it let's talk some deals i mean abel i know you had a fun 2020 um seth i remember talking to you about a couple of deals you did vinky you mentioned some earlier but you know that, that's the fun stuff we're coming down to the wire here 2020 going into the new year um what's the push what's everyone raising capital for if you can talk about it um you know what are you looking at what markets are hot so many questions that could throw out there um let's see how do we how are we going to start this <laughs> um i'm going to go clockwise on my screen so i've got me vinky abel and then seth so vinky we'll we'll start with with you uh, what market I'm looking at? I'm looking at the Texan market like everybody else. Texas is super hot market. <laughs> and um, everybody's predicting that it's going to be the next Silicon Valley. A lot of uh, tech companies are moving there. So future looks really good. And the second market that I'm looking one is uh, closer to us. A little bit I'm in California, so looking in Phoenix as well. But um, I would say I'm open to the other markets as well if I do see the opportunity. And then uh, if it fits my criteria, I would like to jump on that. I won't be waiting. Abel, are you closing anything before 2021? Uh, well, we did. Uh, so we are, let's see, we just wrapped up a deal in McAllen, so South Texas. I'm uh, part of a team that, you know, closed a deal down there just last week, the week before. So we're excited, of, you know, $5 million Congrats. deal. And then uh, in November uh, was part of uh, 120 units in Greenville, so just outside of Dallas. So got another deal there. So we're super excited. I had a really small stake in a triple net lease that we were talking about on our yeah. podcast or – I think when I was interviewing you or one of the, it one might of the have been Michael, but still, I didn't, I, I don't think I knew that. Tell, yeah. I'd like to hear about it. <laughs> uh, you know, really it's a bigger team, a lot of expertise doing the deal. And I'm, you know, I have my small minority stake in that deal. So excited about the triple net part of it. And uh, we just, Are you, you know, to, you, what, what type? Oh of yeah. Cause it was a, it's a industrial warehouse, a three property portfolio across a few States. Uh, and essentially you have a business that uh, owns property. And just like if you owned a single family house and instead of cash out refinancing it, uh, you can you know, sell the property and sign a lease to stay in it. That's what single, you know, if you were a single family uh, entity, well, this is just a business doing the same thing, except they sign a triple net lease for some period of you know, years. Uh, this one was 20. And then uh, the, you know, we buy the property the company stays in it, triple net lease. You don't have the top line expenses <laughs> that a uh, a multifamily deal has. Uh, so it's it's basically all income. And then uh, on a triple net lease, the owner takes care of like the basic infrastructure, the insurance, the taxes, essentially all, so all of the expenses. Toilets, portion. termites, and maintenance. I think Everything. that's the... Yeah. You know, toilets, termites, and, and even they're the tenant. You're like, you, you, good luck on that one. So then uh, that, that gets leased back to them, and that's a deal. And then uh, we just launched a fund, a new uh, 506C fund. So I can basically open and share it, like an impact investment, you know, with a nonprofit in it. So we're going to be raising, you know, a few million bucks to, uh, to, to go acquire a multifamily in about nine different, uh, nine different markets. And... Uh, we have an amazing opportunity to just, you know, turn, turn around a really good return for our investors. And uh, we're a fund of funds in that one. So we have some pretty big entities uh, lining it up. And then uh, we, you know, essentially ride in as an LP or a fund rides as an LP in a, in a larger entities uh, acquisition. So we're excited about those probably, you know, going to be one of the, one of the good deals for us for, uh, for the years to come. So excited. Making moves. Hey man, we're trying. Sorry, Seth. <laughs> Sorry, Seth. No worries, man. Abel, and just to piggyback off what you, what you're saying about those triple net leases, man, those are just really good investments um, from my perspective for you know high income earning professionals like doctors and lawyers and folks like that that have a lot of money, but they have you know a high intensity job where they've got they don't have a lot of hours in their day. You can actually own those properties and you don't have a lot 
of things that you've got to keep up with because it is triple net and these are almost true triple net where you don't have any real responsibilities as the owner as compared to let's say a multifamily where if you're the direct operator or the sponsor on the deal you have tons of stuff to do as we all know but compared to, the, to those if you get in one of these triple net retail uh, types of deals where it's like a pharmacy or you know gas station something like that or fast food restaurant there's just not a lot to do because the tenant takes care of everything. So they're really good investments for, for high income folks that, you know, have a regular day job that's pretty intensive and they don't have a lot of time to, to add to that. Agreed. And then with, yeah. And then with respect to deals that I have right now, we actually closed on a 336 unit property in Winston Salem, North Carolina. That's a great deal. It's already Boom. performing. We're already, we're already giving uh, distribution checks out to our members. So everything's going great. Um, we're actually still raising a little bit for that post close. Um, so if you're interested, we can still get you on. Um, but it is getting towards the end of the year. So, you know, there's not, there's only a few days left to take advantage of that cost seg. Um, and then we're on another deal right now. Can't say a whole lot about it yet. Cause it's not closed yet. Um, and then as far as markets are concerned, you know, really looking at, you know, I, I, you know, I love Texas, love the Carolinas, love Florida, love Phoenix, places like that. That's where we're looking. Um, if you want to continue to see the returns that a lot of our investors are expecting, you know, right now you're going to have to look a little bit outside of, you know, the downtown areas. You're going to have to look into those sub markets of the sub markets or the secondary and tertiary cities like Winston-Salem, North Carolina, who's that's on the up and up because of the entire state being on the up and up. I like that you said sub-markets of the sub-markets because that's one thing that I know Abel and I dove into and I'm going to keep plugging this guys, but our, our Dream Chasers, his Dream Chasers interview goes live tomorrow. Catch that at dreamchasers-ix.com. I'll put that in the chat. But um, yeah, the sub-markets, Abel, what was it, the I-35 corridor? Is that what it is? Something's lighting up in Texas where you're just like, yeah, I'm, I'm cool here. I'm good here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the up and coming spot. So Texas- You Texas can just like talk about some of those spots, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, people look at, you know, Texas, it's got Dallas, right? Huge primary market, which Vinky, once you mentioned like Silicon Valley-esque, I think I just saw uh, an article that- Dallas DFW beat out uh, Manhattan for like the number one or whatever uh, real estate market. You know, I'm like, what? that's crazy. And then something else. So I think in the same report, it talks about, you know, becoming a new Silicon Valley from people jumping. But, you know, that's a super hardcore primary market. Well, there's a bunch of secondary and tertiary markets in Texas that all work from a mechanic standpoint because we're so spread out. Uh, and part of that is the I-35 corridor, 35 north going from San Antonio to Austin. It's about a 45 minute cruise without traffic. With traffic, it turns into about an hour and a half. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, you have like San Marcos, you have Cibolo, you have Shirts, you have um, uh, Buda, and then uh, South Austin. So all of that stuff is doing really well. Uh, becoming a little, they're, they're becoming a little proud of their real estate and uh, prices are, are going up. But, you know, when you just see that, uh, you know, forecast over the next 20 years, population, population growth and cities connecting. And, you know, that's like, man, Austin and San Antonio Metro will become one big I-35 corridor Metro uh, would be pretty cool. So all that stuff is what we talked about last time. It's really awesome. Yeah, I, I, I kind of, you know, look at it uh, from this angle because, all these big corporate companies, whether it's a tech company or any other, any other companies, they learned uh, this working from home or working remotely, like really fast during COVID now. So this is a new phenomenon, right? So it's gonna boost the tertiary markets more because people know they can work off anywhere. So it's a great opportunity for those markets, you know, so, which is really good. And thanks for sharing all those markets with us, Abel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No problem. I can't buy them all. There's no way. <laughs> so you guys can buy some. All right. So we are all unified through the through the podcast launchers uh, thread on LinkedIn. So I want to talk a little bit about podcasting, especially Abel and Seth. Um, I'm really curious to hear you guys take on like you guys. Uh, Abel, correct me if I'm wrong. Your launch was was within the past like six months, right? For your show, September of 2020. September, and then. And then Seth just launched. Uh, from what I can see, both of you guys did a fantastic job preparing, 
getting it out of the gate and now getting that early momentum going, you know, I think everyone wants to try and there's that, that famous, like getting the new and noteworthy or whatever within the first, however many weeks or months, that seems like it's everyone's goal. Uh, whether or not you guys hit that, I mean, it seems like you're following the right framework. So I just want to talk about like your experiences through that. And then Vinky, I know you're getting ready to launch a podcast. And I think with our buddy Raju Datla, which would, that'd be pretty cool to see you guys partner up and, and co-host a show. Um, let's see uh we'll we'll guess we'll start with seth but i mean i know you went you got a marketing firm you did some things i've seen your show now i've listened to it like very well produced and executed what's your advice to someone out there what's your advice to seth bradley you know six months ago (laughs) yeah i mean i i think the key is you know there's going to be a lot of work up front and you you've got to accept that going into it i mean you can launch a podcast pretty easily just you know launch one every single week and that's fine and dandy but you're never going to get that momentum unless you focus on putting in the work up front maybe front loading a lot of episodes like i've front loaded 20 episodes and i've got another 15 to 20 already ready to go uh once i get into my normal normal cadence of once per week but i'm launch i launch five to begin with and then i'm launching one every weekday until i hit 20 and then i'll go into the normal normal cadence of one per week so it's really important to get a lot of those downloads, get a lot of those subscriptions, ratings, reviews. I mean, you've got to, as soon as you launch, make sure you go out, ask all your friends and family for a rating and review, just pester them till they do it, because it's just really important to hack those algorithms and, and get in, uh, you know, come up early in those searches when people are looking for those keywords, if it's real estate or passive income or commercial, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, for your podcast to come up early in that search, you need to get the, that momentum out of the gate. What do you think, Abel? I see you po- posting <laughs> those stats on a weekly basis. You're getting those downloads up. <laughs> I, agree. I agree with everything that Seth mentioned. Uh, you know, um, so if anybody's thinking about starting a podcast uh, and, and you, you know, you're dead set on doing it, I would say the formula that Seth just mentioned was a winning formula for me. Uh, recorded as many as I could before I yeah, actually launched one so that you had a number of shows to release at the same time, all on the same date. Uh, that allows somebody to kind of like binge listen or binge watch or whatever through a number of those podcasts and say, hey, this, one, this is a good one, as opposed to wait another week before you have four others. You may not get that initial yeah. traction. So I did the same. Uh, and I would say now looking back on it, the, uh, you know, just one thing to really dig into is like your name, your mission, your uh, podcast, part of it. So my, our podcast is five talents podcast. It was five talents because our company was five talents, commercial real estate. Um, it, you know, special meaning for us, you know, Matthew 25 and, and 14 is, is the parable of the five talents. However, you know, you, you really have to like dig into that story and you probably have to talk with me or look at our website to really know what five talents podcast is, as opposed to like, choose your, you know, I don't know, live your dream free or, you know, the, the <laughs> live your, you know, live your fantasy podcast or whatever. People are like, that sounds interesting. I'm going to go check it out. So, uh, you know, I didn't take a lot of time and effort into my name. That's what one of the things I would have done. Uh, like, you know, real estate investing free or, you know, something along those lines. But other than that, you know, the record a ton of them, blast them out. I, I am on a, I don't know, I, I guess I just, anything I do, I tend to like go full bore. Uh, I'm pushing out Monday through Friday podcast shows. So five a week, every week, uh, I've recorded and released like 60, maybe 70 shows in the first three months. And I probably have another 20 to 30 recorded. So I'm almost like at a hundred shows. And uh, uh, I factored in editing. I factored in, uh, you know, the, the audio, the video was kind of like went to the wayside. I heard nobody watches it. So everybody's like, okay, I'm gonna hit audio, show notes, artwork, uh, publishing them and, and getting them out there, syndicating them. All that stuff was a factor. What I did not factor is like you publishing them on social, LinkedIn connection. I'm gonna tag everyone and post it every day I have a show out and that has become a beast. Uh, So I would say, uh, just be careful with, you know, how how hard you go, make sure you factor in time for all that stuff. I I didn't factor the social part, but it's been awesome because I feel like I've, I've gotten out there and then, 
Yeah, on the downloads, we're at like 15, almost 15,000 downloads, you know, in the first three months. So I'm excited. And I think that has a lot to do with like just volume, you know, just how many shows we have out there in a short amount of time. Can I ask you one question to both of you, Seth and Abel? Actually, Adam, you too. So since you guys are recording so many shows, uh, I mean, series of uh, episodes, I would say. So do you guys like um, create a storyline for yourself? Like I wanted to say this in episode, this in episode. So kind of, you know, connecting uh, the series together. So if people are binge listening or binge watching, you have a video too, of course, if you're putting those out. So how does that work? If you can enlighten our viewers, you know, or the listeners. That's a I can awesome. chime in. Go ahead, Jeff. Go ahead. Yeah, I can chime in. I mean, so the way I did it is I recorded uh, just 10 episodes that are solo episodes and that's kind of telling a story. So like episode one was just kind of telling my story. And then I kind of went down a pathway of education for the listeners through those 10 solo episodes. And then I, and then the rest of them are all interview episodes. Now those are tough. I mean, you kind of got to interview people as they're available and then maybe just put them out there in a, in a cadence that makes sense to your audience um, as far as their education level. I mean, you don't want to you know, educate them on a syndication until you've done something about, you know, just basic real estate or something like that, you know, it's got to make sense, but it, it's tough to get that to a hundred percent, right? Because, you know, you've got to take the interviews as you can get them. So you've only got so many, so much ammo in the, in the gun. Go ahead, Abel. And I did, uh, yeah, thanks. I did, I uh, haven't done any kind of series and in, in like all the recordings in a shorter period of time, there's no rhythm or rhyme. It was just, record. <laughs> I knew the top guests that I wanted to get. And if they said yes on a certain date, I'm in, I'm in for that interview. So my schedule is pretty crazy. And I, I didn't have any time to kind of like really, you know, plan that out. But it, what Seth mentioned, I, that's what I had planned in the beginning. I was like, I'm going to put out 10 of my own shows in a series, all nice and neat. And then I started doing interviews and I kind of lost track of my own stuff. So my series one is going to end sometime soon here, maybe at a hundred shows. <laughs> and then series two, I'm going to start with like, Hey, my education from one through 10 series or whatever that is. Yeah. The, the reason I asked this question is because our human mind, I think we are conditioned that way because even we are uh, watching the news or even the, I would say any kind of shows on the TV, we just look for kind of storyline. So if there is a storyline, people like really, really connect with you. So since I am kind of new, I'm, I wanted to start my podcast so I can use any tips that you guys have. So that's the reason I was wondering, how did you guys do it? So we can just follow the suit. Yeah, there's, I think there's, so the, the cool thing about it is there's so many um, right ways you can do it. I think uh, there is no one winning formula. The main thing is just be ready to create and push out as much as you can. I think as we can all agree, like from the beginning, a um, little teaser here that came to mind. Uh, so Whitney Sewell has probably one of the most noteworthy shows in our sector, the syndication show. And um, we're getting ready for the 5 million and 30 day summit over at ASIM Capital. And I'm going through his interview he talks about like one thing he would do differently looking back on it. He said he would, would have started releasing 10 to 15 episodes per week if he had to go back. So an episode a day is crazy, but I mean, some of the best in the industry are saying, you know, just fire hose them. Uh, we get nervous sometimes. We don't want to like blow up people's notifications or whatever, but it's just like something to take consideration. If that's what the best are saying, you, you might want to consider it. And then, and he pushes. He pushes um, seven I know Reed a week also... right now, right? He he does like Saturday and Sunday, and he's saying he would double that. He would just blast them all out. I think my connection cut out. <laughs> yeah, we're losing your connection a little bit. A little bit. But, oh, hold on. I did. But I I think uh, while you're while it's coming back, I think I've heard that correctly because sorry about that. <laughs> uh, you all good. He he does like seven shows a a week right now, right? Like Monday through Friday. And he probably had some of the hopper. You're saying he would he would have just blasted them all out as he had them. Yeah, sorry, it came through choppy there. But yeah, Whitney was like, yeah, if I had to start, it's funny. One of the best shows in the industry is like, if I had to start over again from the beginning, I would have started do it, doing it by 10 to 15 episodes per week. <laughs> it's just like, wow, okay. Woo! I mean, so and, you got- and The guy's gotta, done like 800 something shows or probably 900 or a thousand now. <laughs> wow. you, gotta 
dedicate some time to it. I think the, the, the most successful ones that do it again, I'll use Whitney. I know Joe Farrellis does this and I'm sure you guys can relate and maybe even you guys have your, your schedule structured this way, but they just have an entire day blocked out for recording episodes. So if you're doing however many episodes, if you have a whole day dedicated to recording, you can knock out 10 in one day or something like that. So, um, and then Vinky, I know that re I'm sure Abel and Seth, you guys, are you familiar with Reed Goosens? Yep. Oh. He's, um, he's, he's an Aussie, uh, in your area, yeah. Abel. Um, and Reed, Reed's a good friend of mine. I know him through Hunter and, um, I know he speaks about how his first 30 episodes were specifically, uh, published to go along with his, his first book, which was investing in the U S um, I'm sure Reed will be okay with me giving a little plug for him here. So I'm going to put it in our Facebook chat, but Vinky, if you want to check out Reed's story and kind of how he did his things, um, he's definitely a good, good one to follow. Yeah, and uh, yeah, Abel, I just, I love your show notes, man. I just remembered that when, when our episode went live, Abel and Seth, I, I can't remember if yours, if you have this and I know I don't just cause like, I got to figure out how to factor in the time to make it happen with, all, everything we got going on but like Abel's got like three notable like tweetable quotes he's got like th like there's so many different things as a guest on his show that you can go and share with your network that I think that's very valuable as a host to be providing that for your guests I know it's one thing like I guess oh you know yeah forget about this tactical stuff Adam yeah like I I give all of my guests uh an email the day before it comes out here are four pieces of artwork LinkedIn Insta Facebook and one other one, I forget the four <laughs> platforms. I'm only on two, like Facebook and LinkedIn myself, but I know people are on other stuff. So they've got four pieces of artwork. They can just take that and it's already optimized for each platform. The link, of course, my links, if they want to, they want to tag me. And then I give them the two quotes or a couple, you know, one or two notable quotes. They can just copy and paste. And then I do the show notes in a broken down time, like out of our, 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, if you look at my show notes, they're broken down. First five minutes is intro. First, you know, next 15 minutes is we break into the market. We break into how we got started. We break into thoughts on interest rates or, you know, what, even this conversation, you could break it down. And, and I think, you know, hopefully some people appreciate that. It takes a little while. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I was uh, listening to Joe Fairless's book too, and he did mention that too, that initially he started doing like the episodes once a week or something like that. It wasn't that pitch, you know, but when he started doing daily, it was, uh, he was really, really successful. So it kind of resonates with the read, uh, like you were saying, Adam, I will look him up as well. Sure thing. Um, so here we go, winding it down. We got about five minutes left. I think Vinky, I can't remember you were you were maybe joining us. I was letting the guys know we're all very busy, so I'm sure we got something on the hour coming up. Um, Seth, I hope you're doing all right in, in cold West Virginia. But oh, uh, good to go, man. <laughs> let's spice things up here. Um, I don't even know how actually. This is completely off the top of my head right now. Let's start with um, the one. Let's niche it down. I was going to say the one thing about commercial real estate, but let's say like the one niche, the one uh, asset class, the one asset class besides multifamily that you're bullish about for 2021. And we're going to start with, I'm going, going clockwise. Vinky, you're no, up first. Go with somebody else this time. <laughs> <laughs> go with Abel. <laughs> okay, Abel, you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Besides multifamily, man, put us on a spot here. You know, I love my multifamily is number one. It, it's a, it, it's, it's going to be between, you know, I re, the single family market and asset classes. I don't think anything's going to go wrong there. I've seen some data points uh, that uh, I'm trying to think of the articles. I can't reference them off the top of my head, but there's a couple articles where it talks about uh, consumer spending being low, like all time record low. However, the one area that consumer spending is all time like record high was buying houses. Uh, it's harder for people to qualify. I think this the banks are scrutinizing credits and background and all that stuff. And if you're, you know, in an unfortunate spot, you know, yourself with, you know, lost job and things like that, you know, pandemic, that's, that's horrible. That sucks. 
but the people that are kind of in that sweet spot of like, no, you know, COVID really didn't affect them. They were able to work remotely. Their pay is still coming in, their technology or whatever job, those people uh, that can still qualify and get, a, it's like the best time to get, you know, an all time record interest rate. So uh, we, st we still do single family houses. We're doing a, you know, we bought a foreclosure and a, uh, sorry, a short sale. And then we're about to put another one on the market, a flip that we did. And, you know, I, while I personally don't spend a lot of time on it, we have, I have a team that I'm kind of blessed with that helps me do that stuff through our uh, entities. I mean, I'm still investing in, in that area. It's just, it's just, it takes so long. It's so hard. Uh, a lot of resources, a lot of money, a lot of time to do like one. Uh, but I think it's still a winning asset class if you really have a system in place there. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I think it was Seth actually recently, someone was talking about how um, multi, or single family actually tends to be an asset class that now that we're in this commercial space or sector, there's enough people that say, like, don't waste your time with single family. But if you know what you're doing, there's a lot of value still sitting there. So Seth, I don't, I don't know if that's how you're feeling about 2021 as well, but... <laughs> Yeah, that's right, man. I'm, that was me that mentioned that. Uh, and Abel, I agree with you 100%. I think that, you know, a lot of people in commercial and multifamily are just kind of like, they just put residential to the wayside once they kind of make that leap and they just kind of downplay it and say, oh, you know, it's too much work. There's too much, you know, too much of this, too much of that. And to a certain extent, it's true. But, you know, when there's opportunities, you've got to take advantage of it. And I believe that there will be a lot of opportunities with foreclosures and things like that coming through the pipeline in the next six to 18 months, depending on what state you are, to get, um, you know, the, the moratoriums start going away and the government aid starts going away. So there'll be some, some opportunities in the residential space. And that's where I cut my teeth. So I always keep my eyes out for those types of opportunities. Um, in addition to that, I'm really bullish on hospitality because, you know, it's down significantly because of COVID. Obviously, everybody's hurting in that industry, but it's going to come back. I mean, we're talking about retail or office, you know, they might have to get a little bit more creative with with what they're doing there. And I, I think, you know, that they'll, they'll reinvent themselves and find a way. Um, but hospitality is just a temporary downside. Um, as soon as COVID starts going away and people start going back out and start traveling again, hospitality is going to come back. Those folks are only in trouble because they, they don't have enough reserves to hold on to these properties. So if you can buy them right now and I'm seeing them for 30, 40, 50 cents on the dollar and you can and you have the, the reserves and things to hold on to these things through the through the COVID and the pandemic, then uh, very bullish on on hospitality coming back strong. I think you just swayed swayed. I was going to say. Um something a little bit more towards a triple net and, and single tenant um, triple net lease real estate, just because that's what we're in. And I do believe that's a good place to park your capital. But Seth, uh, you just reminded me, hospitality is definitely a great place to look if you're just interested in long-term opportunity, because um, someone we interviewed on our show, he's been in, been in the industry for, I don't know, 30, one of the guys has just been in forever, <laughs> 30 plus years. And he's like, the thing about hotels and restaurants too, um, he's like, it's the hermit crab theory, like a hotel at the end of the day or a restaurant, like it's built to be a restaurant. It's built to be a hotel. And so it might go vacant or whatever, but at the end of the day, like a hermit crab, when it outgrows its shell, it leaves and another hermit crab come in and, and grow into that shell and fit into that shell. So if you've got a hermit crab shell, you're eventually going to have the, the hermit crab work its way back into your, into your shell. And I think you're spot on with that in the hospitality. It might be a while before the big boom, but now is the time to position yourself. So well, I can't, so. Rem I can't remember who I talked to. Somebody was telling me about a billion dollar hotel in New York, somewhere there. And it, it was being traded for like $300 million. And yeah, I'm like, know. yeah. Oh, okay. With enough time. <laughs> that was an amazing buy. <laughs> You're yeah. like, geez, you know, and it might not take that long. I mean, it might be two years. Yeah. And yeah, I, I did hear from, uh, from, uh, a reliable source. Don't want to put him out there without his permission yet, but a reliable source that we still might have to wait till 2024 for the full surge back. But I mean, Hey, there you go. Go find yourself a $300 million slash $300 roll. Dollar hotel. <laughs> <laughs> um, Vinky, did we, you know, you, you pushed it over to Abel. So here we go. Go yeah. ahead. Close us out. What are you looking into? I, 
I agree with 100% able and Seth because uh, that's what I was thinking too. Yeah, the single family home first and then hospitality. Hospitality is under my radar for a long time before even I started in multifamily. So that's something to look into now because uh, I agree with Seth, the uh, landscape is gonna change uh, with the COVID getting under control. People are gonna start traveling and it's gonna be bigger than what we have seen before with this whole lockdown, everybody's kind of frustrated. So first chance they're gonna get, uh, get get you know they're gonna try to get out so i think hospitality that's gonna be booming at some time so that's a really good asset class that i'll be closely watching as well and the single family yes if i get the opportunity to get into and closer in my backyard i will love that and i do see there's gonna be a lot of opportunities in this year 2021 you know and uh, things gonna be pretty awesome from the investing per perspective that's what i would say love it all right. And so uh, recently heard from, I can't remember which interview it was, but you're, you're basically, you're not doing a service to your listeners, audience, investors, if you're not leading them to it with a call to action at the end of each presentation. Uh, Vinky and Abel, I know you guys are in front of a computer right now, so we can actually, you guys can go ahead and post your link that you want everyone to go to in the Facebook chat. Seth, if you want to punch it in here on the Zoom chat or have me put it in there for you, <laughs> I will because I know you're going mobile right now. Um, but yeah, go ahead and get those call to action in there. I guess say it real quick. I'll, I'll just start. Guys, we got the 5 million and 30 day summit coming up over at ASIM Capital. That's January 6th through the 8th. Please use the link below uh, to go ahead and check that out. Um, Vinky, where, where are you going to? I know you're, everyone's multitasking now, <laughs> pulling up their links. Why don't we go with Seth so that way I can look it up for you and put, punch it in there. <laughs> Sounds good. Hey guys, everybody just check out my podcast just launched a couple of weeks ago. Uh, go to passiveincomeattorney.com. That's the best place. It's got the full show notes, all the new episodes and got some freebies on there as well. Passiveincomeattorney.com. Hi everyone. And Here Abel Pacheco, uh, you can find a number of things on our website. Go to the number five T cre.com that's 5tcre.com uh, i talked about an impact investment a fund that we're um, buying multifamily real estate commercial real estate with some amazing returns and helping out uh, by giving back to a nonprofit in our deal so there is that under 5tcre.com fund forward slash fund and then our podcast we put all of our shows our recordings our video and audio uh, connected on our website as well. And then uh, love love to connect with you guys. So reach out to me, my phone number 210-548-5158. Feel free to give me a call too. Brave man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Vinky, uh, I got your your website here. I'm putting it in the Facebook chat. Any, any parting words for our viewers today? Yeah, sure. Please uh, visit my website, uh, www.lumbainvest.com and download my book, Seven Reasons Why Real Estate Syndication Builds Long-Term Wealth. It'll give you some insight that why you wanted to look in this asset class and why you wanted to invest. And I'm here to educate you um, with any of your real estate needs. Um, please uh, reach out through my website and my number, if you wanted to call me direct, my number is 925-250. 3907. Thanks. Love it. All right, guys. Well, thank you for uh, for jumping in the fire here with, with me. We all jumped in the fire today. I think this went really well. Uh, hopefully we can do this again. I know uh, I keep saying this. We all got stuff coming up here. So I'm going to go ahead and end it. And I'll talk to you guys later in the podcast launchers group. If you want to get added, to, that's, I guess, the final thing. If you want to be a part of the podcast launchers LinkedIn thread, let us know. We'll work you in there. It's been very valuable. Um, as Highly you valuable. Is a product of it right here. So, yes. all right, guys. Thanks, take care. Guys. Bye, everyone.